Welcome to Korean Ruins, who now has 20,000 downloads. I don't know if that's a lot is that a lot i think that's quite a lot it's only taken three years <laughs> <laughs> yeah what's nice is it's, it seems to be going up and up which is quite I know. fun but yeah. it's, it's a what's the term for a a covid like graph um exponential it's exponential growth oh yeah <laughs> exponential <laughs> we can only account it to all the fantastic participants we've had recently it's been a real pleasure this season hasn't it because for the first time most of our guests have a wikipedia page so it makes introductions really easy <laughs> <laughs> anyway mate how you been yeah good um i must admit i've had a fairly ordinary few weeks of teaching terms kicking off life's getting busy we regularly ask all of our guests about envy and i must admit i've been a bit envious this last week or so yeah oh yeah shamefully but who have you been envious of i've been envious of uh, some of the pictures you've been sending there was one in particular that um I, it, it <laughs> burned into my retinas and it's now in at least one powerpoint um and it was a, a cross section through some trees showing a ground surface underneath and the the the, the power of that image in my conscious this week has been has been quite quite dominant <laughs> did you like how i preempted you that you were jealous of me <laughs> i think you knew full well where i was going <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've been playing with drones and lasers up in in yorkshire as part of my day job but i had the pleasure of having today's guest join us as well so we'll, we'll probe him a bit on that going forwards but um had a great week up at wycombe forest in yorkshire as part of forestry england's um so we've been investigating how we can implement or if we should and could use um, drone-based LIDAR. So it's normally fixed onto large aircrafts, but this is something that can fly 70 metres above the ground and and collect huge amounts of spatial data. And we can peel back those trees and uh, find archaeology. You guys are the experts here, so I, I'm not going to shame myself by going into too much detail. But from what I could see in the pictures you were sending, the data looked quite good. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty spectacular. So we, we obviously doing any form of laser scanning from an aircraft over a, over a uh, forest is going to be tricky because you're going to hit a lot, get a lot of returns and data from the tops of the tree canopy. So I was very sceptical about how successful this technique was going to be over a more standardised approach that, that Stuart, I'm sure he'll speak about later, but also my, my experience in New Forest has shown that it, the LiDAR data has really good, powerful um, applications within archaeology to map and record lost features, but not, wasn't sure about its application on a drone and it's looking pretty pretty juicy. But well, we, we should have some interesting output. Time team came along and recorded our work, so uh, we should have some good outputs for people to uh, to explore in the future, hopefully. That's really exciting. I look forward to seeing it and look forward to seeing what they strap onto a drone next. Mm, yeah, no, it'd be good. But um, other than having a lot of fun, it's been a bit of a reflective week, hasn't it? Yeah, it's been a been an odd one. There's been a few things that have occurred. So working in a university, we have something called visiting fellows and visiting research fellows. And every now and again, you you renew their, their fellowship as time goes by. And we've had a bit of a sad week the last week because we've had to sadly pass away um, to two of our visiting fellows who I, th- I think influenced both of our careers in, in one way or another, um, Jeff Charter and, and uh, Bruce Eagles. Um, Jeff, for example, was one of my first lecturers when I was an undergrad. Um, he was the first person to show me GIS, Same. which uh, at the time, I must admit, I thought, I don't know about this, but it became more and more important in my life and research and way I conceptualise and see the world. So an incredible influence um, and very sad, sad to have lost him. But also um, Bruce, who has been, he's been a part of the fabric of Bournemouth for far longer than, than either of us. But I know he, I know he was particularly special in your life and you've got some memories of, of Bruce haven't you yeah Bruce is, was just the nicest gentleman you could you could possibly meet obviously Jeff as you say had a huge influence on I wouldn't be playing with lidars and drones if I hadn't learned GIS so thank you Jeff for that but Bruce um I, I'll, I'll be the first to admit I wasn't a fantastic undergraduate I'd much rather be out in a rowing boat or going out having a dance with my mates in the clubs but um as a very lost third year um who was looking at um, the correlation between Anglo-Saxon burials with um, prehistoric burial 
burial mounds. Bruce took me under his wing and gave me so much time and thought and consideration and got me across the line. And um, that ability to influence and shape my interest and engagement in, in the subject has gone so far to where I am today. And the nicest, most gentle character you'll ever meet and a, a fascinating career in terms of um, working for the RCHME, so the Royal Commission for Historic Monuments in England, um, also the National Archaeological Records and um, his work around medieval boundaries and um and particularly in wessex is just yeah groundbreaking and just such such a sad loss for for everybody yeah no massively and it, it got me thinking and, I, and we were discussing it before we hit record that um it's a theme that's popped up occasionally in the podcast in the past and that of that of mentorship and the, the importance and the value of kind of positive mentors particularly in those early stages of of our careers and i think we probably all had them anyone in who's who's got a functioning career in ruins that probably hasn't got there without the support and help of a good mentor so a bit of a shout out to the mentors out there and a thank you for the ones that, that shaped both of our lives and and hopefully one day we can live up to that ourselves and and do the same thing. Actually, I know I know a few students who you've mentored, Lawrence, and are off doing really wonderful things now. So it's... well, I think you've you've mentored them as well, Derek. If we're thinking the same <laughs> one, so yeah, we we will do our yeah. bit. But I guess that's a nice link. Speaking of mentors, we've had a new mentor in the last few months, haven't we? Yeah, we've had a few, some more than others. Thanks for joining us last week, John. Um... <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, I mean, there's positive mentors and negative mentors, I guess, and there's certainly a new positive mentor um, could be pointed towards today's guest. Absolutely. One of the most pleasurable people to have met in the last year, I must admit. Um, yeah, a highlight of 2021 for me. That's it. So I guess it's a lovely segue into introducing today's guest of Stuart Ainsworth, who's an um, ar- archaeological surveyor, um, started life as a train surveyor, moved into Ordnance Survey, worked in the Royal Commission for Historic Monuments and in, for, of England, um, moved, which then transitioned into to um, English Heritage, Historic England, um, where he was the head of its landscape investigation team. Um, And um, I think... Correct me if I'm wrong, history. I think you might have done one or two time teams as well. <laughs> I've, I've got a quote here that says you're affectionately known as time teams lumps and bumps, man. <laughs> <laughs> Strangely enough, that's how I refer to myself these days. I, I, have, I have no other skill in life other than to be able to read lumps and bumps. <laughs> I hate to correct you, Lawrence, but um, a lot of that introduction, the words, the words were right, but not necessarily in the right order. Oh, oh, <laughs> well, yeah, this is the beauty of this podcast, Stuart. You can correct my. Uh, well, once you've once you corrected me, maybe go to Wikipedia and correct your Wikipedia. Page. <laughs> Before I, I actually reveal in any of my past, I, I would like to echo your your thoughts about about Bruce Eagles because. Uh, when I joined the Royal Commission on the Historical Monuments of England, to give it its full title, Lawrence, <laughs> um, he was already established as an investigator in, in the Royal Commission. And, and he was one of life's real gentlemen, a pleasure to spend time with him, work with him and learn from him. And you know, it was great sadness when, when in fact, when you, you told me last week that he, he'd passed away. And uh, it's really nice to, um, it's never nice to hear anybody passing away, but actually the way you conveyed it when we were walking up through the forest, um, being out in the landscape and and when you actually um, brought the subject up, I thought this is, this is the life that Bruce had and that we've all shared, that joy of being out in the landscape looking at objects from the past, looking at how landscapes evolved. And and somehow it seemed quite right, rather than a text message or a Zoom call or something you read in the paper. It, 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 uh, it's actually quite an interesting moment. It, it felt right in the wrong sort of way. <laughs> oh, hey, hey, hey. Thank you. Well, thank you for for those echoes, Stuart, and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, it, uh, we've been looking forward to this chat um, very, very much. And um, rather than beating around the bush too much, I think we should ask you or invite you to to talk us through your career in ruins and correct all those uh, those things that I got wrong. <laughs> just <saying. laughs> right. Well, I um, I started life with the my working life that is with the Ordnance Survey. 
Uh, I'd had a passion for for maps since I was a, a young kid. Used to sit upstairs in in the attic in our, in our house with my brother, and my brother used to make up fictitious landscapes by drawing drawing theoretical towns and landscapes. He used to make his own maps, and we used to sit and build towns in map form. And that's how I kind of got kind of interested in in the process, as it were, the idea that you could not only buy a map in the shop that shows you somewhere, but also you could make it your own maps if you wanted to and add things. That whole kind of artistry of, of map making I was introduced to at that time. Um, so by, when I got the opportunity, I, I joined the Ordnance Survey to be a, a professional map maker and, and surveyor with them and uh, had a, a wonderful career uh, working in all the lovely places, the Lake District, the Yorkshire Dales, the North Pennines, most of the upland zones in the in the north of England. I worked in towns, I've worked in cities. But I more and more I was interested in the past. And the minute I knew the Ordnance Survey had an archaeology division, I thought, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. I want to get, I want to, to learn more about archaeology. So I joined their archaeology division and... They actually paid me and trained me to wander around these lovely places, looking at archaeological sites, trying to work out what should go on the map, learning how to read the earthworks. It was like an apprenticeship scheme almost, learning from professionals. I was, I was mentored by people who'd done it for most of their life, try and work out what the story was, and then at the end of that process, survey onto the Ordnance Survey map and you, you know, all today you can all see these these wonderful archaeological sites on, on the Ordnance Survey maps that you now get mostly in digital form rather than paper form but that that's another uh, that's a rant I'll, I'll go on later on but I spent many years working with the Ordnance Survey archaeology division day by day learning by looking looking at the landscape, looking at the modern landscape as much as the historic landscape and trying to work out how things gel together, how landscapes change through time. Landscapes of the past don't stand still. They evolve over thousands of years and you've got, always got to acknowledge you're dealing with thousands of years of change. Anyway, uh, to cut a long story short, then the Northern Survey decided it, it wasn't going to have an archaeology division anymore. <laughs> uh, and, and so I decided to take my leave of the Northern Survey for a while and I managed to get a secondment and go to the Caribbean for two years. <laughs> an obvious transition, <laughs> well, not bad. <laughs> uh, it, yeah. It, yeah, it, it, somebody had to do it, didn't they? But it was great. I was map making on two islands in the Caribbean, St Kitts and, and Nevis which we later came back and did a time team on this event in, in Nevis, which was great. Um, so I spent two years then mapping in detail the landscape of two Caribbean islands, which included lots of um, Amerindian archaeology, Arawak archaeology, as well as plantation archaeology of the colonial periods and fortifications, plantation houses, um, like bits of little England transported into the Caribbean and bits of little France and bits of little Spain and uh, that, that's a cultural class that you had in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries. And I got involved in the archaeology of a Caribbean landscape while I was out there. Then when I came, when the Kurtz comment was up, I came back to the UK, went back to the Ordnance Survey, I thought, well, it's a bit boring now to go back and work just just making maps of Coventry, which is where which is where where they decided they'd sent me. It's a bit like the army. Where would you like to go? You volunteer to go somewhere. They'll they'll send you somewhere entirely different. And and I was literally sent to Coventry. Um, I, I spent I spent about two months working in Coventry and thought I really don't want to do this. Um, and so I wrote to the Royal Commission. I wrote to Peter Fowler, who was the head of the Royal Commission then, and said, um, I'd quite like to join the Royal Commission. Have you got any jobs going? And he wrote back and said, yes, there's one at Keele, if you'd like it, <laughs> basically, if you'd like it, because we'd worked together on various <laughs> projects beforehand. Uh, and so I joined the Royal Commission on Historical Monuments, then started almost to move up a league. It was like moving from... The Ordnance Survey, let's say, who were a, a kind of a championship side, they're moving up into the Premier League <laughs> to work for the Royal Commission. 
working with stars from you know from from around the world and and Wessex and places like that, um, and learning not only that that physical process of of reading landscapes on the ground and and interacting with the ground day in day out, but also working alongside academics. And and for me, it was like a leap of understanding. Suddenly, I was exposed to people like Bruce Eagles and Christopher Taylor in particular, who who I worked with for for a number of years, and just to and and a chap called Paul Everson as well, and listened to their their ideas that they would um, espouse when you were looking at landscapes and sites, things I hadn't even thought about before. And they opened up my eyes to a whole level of, of not just archaeological thinking, but philosophical thinking about landscapes and the past. And so my, my eyes were sort of opened. It'd be like having, like being a student at university and suddenly having a, 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 a tutor with you every minute of every working day, working together, staying in, in digs and hotels together, eating together. You can't, you can't not learn from people around you and... And it was vitally important. And, and I then spent, I can't remember how many years doing landscape archaeology then with the Royal Commission. Then the government decided it didn't want uh, to have a Royal Commission on the historical monuments of England. And we were all transferred into English heritage. And we became the landscape investigation team within English heritage. And I stayed there until I, I left um, took early retirement in 2012. And in the middle of all that, I managed to squeeze in 20 years doing time to <laughs> <laughs> No mean feat. So that, that, that's, that's it. <laughs> that's my career. Well, how many years is that then from when you started at Ordnance Survey to finishing at Historic England? Well, I started in 69, 1969 and finished in 2012. You do the maths. Oh, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Far too uh, I'm long. going to guess around 43 years. 43 but, um, years. It's, uh, not, my math is not great. <laughs> <laughs> so please, please tweet or write in to correct me. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. I've got so many questions, but Derek, have you got anything you want to kick off with? Um, I'm, I'm going to go for the for the big question. I, and so if I'm right and it's 43 years, half of that period you were a part of Time Team, which was obviously a, a, a huge chunk of uh, uh, of life and also how how many people would recognise you. But I'm most interested, I think, in how how that came to happen. How did you go from, um, presumably you were, were you at the Ordnance Survey at the time? Or I was, yes, the, that's the right. The Royal Commission. How did, you, how, did you get, how did you get the call up to Time Team? Oh, sorry, I correct myself. No, I was with the Royal Commission when that happened. Um, like, like most things in life, there, I, there was no real plan. It, it, it mm. wasn't a, a planned move. At that time, uh, I was working the Royal Commission. There was a young girl who just joined the organisation not long before called Carenza Lewis. You may have heard of her. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like one of the, like to you, one of your students almost. Um, she was new, new into the Royal Commission. And we'd done bits of work together. And when Carenza started on Time Team, she did Series 1, the Time Team. Mm -hmm. And... Just one evening, completely out of the blue, I got a call from Carenza that said she'd been doing Time Team, had I seen it? Or, yeah, I'd seen it, you know, look good. But do you fancy coming along and helping out? <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, that looks good, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd watched it, um, yeah, that'd be interesting. So I went along to do one programme at Tockenham, uh, which was a Roman villa, and I stayed 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't get rid of you. <laughs> um, it, I just went down to do the one. And to be frank about that period, when Time Team was first made in Series 1, it was a relative shock to the archaeology world, um, this, te this type of television archaeology being done in three days. And there were a lot of negative comments in, in, in some of the, um, you know, the archaeological circulations as it were about whether you could do archaeology in two days whether everything was being done properly that sort of thing so when i went along for that one program part of part of my mind was is it actually being done properly i don't know all i all i'd seen was a television program the minute i got there and and saw the usual crowd as it were people i both knew were professionals 
Uh, most of them had long beards and, and long hair at that time. <laughs> and you saw people sitting in trenches with recording forms, doing the routine housekeeping of archaeology that has to be done, and spending three days in and amongst it. I, I had confidence it was being done properly. And, and uh, unfortunately, when people watch television programmes, particularly then about archaeology, showing people filling in recording forms actually ain't that televisual, is it, really? <laughs> um, so a lot of the stuff that we do routinely in archaeology doesn't get, doesn't get broadcast. Um, and I wanted that reassurance when I went there. I found and got that reassurance and uh, been happy to, to do the 20 years that I've done with them. So it's a pure accident, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a happy accident, though. <laughs> happy accident, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, that 20 years must have taken you all over the place, Stuart, and to, to a whole manner of different landscapes and stories and histories. Is, is there one particular thing that stands out for you in that 20 year period, or are there just so many things? It's all fantastic. Oh, there, there are there are almost too too many things to to think through for a, for a brain of my, of my limited <laughs> capacity, Lawrence. But the, um, I think what I, what I should say in answer to that question is that you can't not spend as much time looking at landscapes as I've spent and then suddenly being catapulted, <laughs> which is what Time Team was. You, we didn't have any choice, really, about where the sites were. We were just told where they were. Um, so you're catapulted into... Completely new landscapes, new geology, new archaeology, and you had to rapidly assimilate it, learn from others around about you who did know it better than you, the local experts and, and people who spent time there. So every site you went to was a learning experience. It was like going to university and, and doing your entire degree in like three weeks instead of three years type of thing. You were just swamped by information and and it was most wonderful opportunity to learn a lot about uh, an awful lot about one place very quickly and all the time in landscape archaeology in particular which is the only thing i can speak about with any authority i'm rubbish at everything else um it's that process of seeing something learning from it putting it upstairs in your own database and then you move on to another landscape and you take you keep building up all the time mm. your experiences, what you've seen somewhere else, have you seen it before? And and people sometimes used to look at me a bit bizarrely when you'd be in the middle of Wessex or somewhere or Somerset, uh, and you'd say, oh, I've seen a site like this in, in, in southern Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as, as if it couldn't yeah. be relevant because it was in southern Scotland. <laughs> um, and it, it's, it's having that breadth of experience. Um, and Time Team suddenly introduced me to like 230, 240 new landscapes mm, over the course yeah. I did it. So, yes, there are highlights in individual sites sometimes, but the, to me, the highlight is the whole package. Mm. That's a great answer, Stuart. And there's a few things that based on that answer and, and going back to your earlier points of your career that you, you sort of went through previously that I'd like to pull out in, in, and discuss. That's all right. So first of all, I'm just highlighting that uh, one of the things you, you said is learning by looking. And you've also talked about listening and building up your database and you're giving off this really good impression of uh, this insight into your inquisitive nature of um of the archaeology and i guess would you say that was kicked off effectively you started off as a geographer you're building your, you're building your townscapes your urban city states with your brother in when you're growing up you're building maps you join you do an ordnance survey to to map things and um then you sort of moved in or fell in is that a fair statement to the to the archaeology division and and you, that's when you started to listen and learn and look and um do you, would you say that inquisitive nature has driven your career quite a bit Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I was one of those kids who would continuously say, why is it like that? What's that? You know, that kind of nosiness that uh, you, you're unembarrassed about when you're, when you're very young. Um, but I, I have to say that one of the things I, I, I think is almost a key skill for not just any for landscape archaeologists or, or historical geographers or any type of archaeologist, really, uh, that being inquisitive is... I suspect we all are 
we want to know, don't we? Mm. We want to know what happened in the past and we want to try and get the evidence to find out you know, how, how to get there, as it were, and, and what the answers are. So inquisitiveness is a core mindset to have as an archaeologist. You've got to want to know. And by looking at things, it's a very human thing. But the thing I often pass on to both students and younger people and members of the public, so I do a lot of community archaeology work now, is that those two skills together, inquisitiveness and, and learning to look, are actually all you really need <laughs> to be a landscape archaeologist. All the knowledge about all the authors and the books and historiographies and all these things that academics love to, to, to spout on about, you know, they, they all do it, don't they, Derek? They all stand up in front of classes of students and, and impress everybody with their knowledge of who wrote what about what, what their latest theory is. <laughs> and I want to <laughs> see. You, 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 you say that, Stuart, you say that, but... Just this week, I had, um, I think it was the second lecture in an archaeological practice, first year series, and I, I ranted and raved for about two hours solidly about the importance of just going outside and being able to pick apart the landscape and and uh, enjoy the lumps and bumps. And this time next week, I'm going to be telling them to listen to this podcast because it'll it'll help them. <laughs> it's such a good point, though, Stuart, about the, the importance of being inquisitive. And it, it's very easy as a student, I think, to be embarrassed to come forward or ask questions or, or not want to to um, stand out from from the crowd so it, it's a really good point from anyone in kicking off their career or as an undergraduate or a master student whatever stay stay inquisitive stay don't don't be afraid to ask questions there's no there's no stupid questions oh, oh god you, you beat me to it there Lawrence. I need, you should hear what Derek comes out with it yeah. <laughs> 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 um, uh, the, the other thing that stood out in that initial um, sort of intro to your career Stuart was that you, you um, contacted the Royal Commission because you were looking for a change and presumably that wasn't an advertised post then you just you took a punt you said you are you I'm going to be the master of my own destiny here and and see see what whether I can get involved is is that a fair statement I think I think it's fair there is a slight bit of background in there in that when it was decided that the ordnance survey would no longer have an archaeology division and that the people in the archaeology division would be transferred to the Royal Commission on Historical Monuments, there was a process of, mm -hmm. of trying to work out where people went. Right. And there were interviews for England, Scotland and Wales, the, the three Royal Commissions. And I, I went for an interview for the Welsh Commission and, and, and was offered a job. And I was offered a job in the English Commission as well. And when the jobs are offered to me, it was actually, uh, this is really boring stuff, but it was, uh, it wasn't quite the job that I wanted to do in respect of it. It was in effect a downgrading in the salary because of the, you know, these things called pay grades that people have in organisations. Mm -hmm. And it was a step down in a pay grade. Um, being a man of principle and a man uh, from Yorkshire, which is vitally <laughs> important in, in, in that, that part of your life when you've got a mortgage and young children, it was something I wasn't prepared to accept. So I declined the offer to join the Royal Commission, to join both Royal oh. Commissions, mm -hmm. in fact. And, <laughs> and, and so I went back to the Ordnance Survey for a very short time and then saw this advert for the uh, Caribbean. So off I went to the Caribbean. Uh -huh. but, so, <laughs> when, I, when I came back and realised what I really wanted to do was to spend you know, the rest of my career doing archaeology in the field, mm -hmm. there was a little bit of humble pie in that letter I wrote to people <laughs> about <life. laughs> and so, Well, I've had two years having, having a lot of fun, but actually, are there any jobs going? <laughs> that's, that's the full story. <laughs> Before I move on to our, our next proper question, I've got a very, very quick question to, to throw at you, Stuart. And now, 
Lawrence has just said there's no such thing as a stupid question, so I'm going to try and prove him wrong here, potentially. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm i a big fan of Ordnance Survey maps. I've, I'm, I'm a subscriber to the Ordnance Survey app because it, it just I just find navigating to them is much more enjoyable than navigating to a, a Google map, and they're, they're great fun for exploring the landscape. Um, and something I love about them, particularly love about them, is the the detail of some of the historic monuments, particularly on the, the uh, lower scale ones around like 25,000 and one to 25,000 or even the um even one to 50 has some nice nice illustrations but in your time working for the ordnance survey is there any illustration that you think oh i really liked that one i'm looking at maiden castle now and it's a glorious hasher plan of, of maiden <laughs> castle but uh yeah. is, is, do any stand out <laughs> oh they do indeed i i think um there are so many sites that the artistry in cartography of depicting earthworks using the the hasher symbol, the the, the tadpoles, mm. it's an art form in its own right to convey mm. Mm. what is included in that earthwork. You can convey uh, you can convey passion through the hashers, mm. and it's almost you're up, you're in danger of taking the top off the bottle here, Derek. Because I can go on a <laughs> on a rant about digital cartography now, which would uh... <laughs> save it for another podcast. <laughs> I was going to say I'd enjoy the rant and I'd love the rant, but I, I will say and I will echo that um, I don't think that I still don't think there's a better way of displaying 3D archaeological monuments in 2D space than hasher plans. I, I I'm completely with you on on a love for hashers because they they show interpretation, they show the site, mm, they show absolutely. character in a way that I don't think you ever get digitally. <laughs> anyway, I should move on because I can feel myself going down a rabbit hole. <laughs> oh, just very quickly on the on the on the uh, on the mapping front. So you lots of lots of sites you're pleased with, Stuart. Did you do any um any mischievous mapping? Ooh. Anything that you sort of hid in your map uh, as a bit of a, a nod to yourself that no one else would spot? The danger of a podcast is thinking I'm talking to Derek and Lawrence over, <laughs> over a pint in the pub. Should, should, should we save that question for another day? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you answer that That's question. Yes. And, oh, 20,000. Is it 20,000, the figure I heard? <laughs> um, pe- people hear it. But actually... I can actually let you into a little secret or two there because there is a precedent in, in and it has been broadcast by the BBC on one of their, their documentaries about the Ordnance Survey. So I, I know I won't be the first to say it, but there is a tradition and there has been a long tradition in the Ordnance Survey um, by the surveyors. <clears throat> I have to say, and <laughs> as well as the people who draw the maps, because surveyors surveyed on the ground and you actually drew the map with a pen. In the old days, you did it all with a pen and then you sent it off to a cartographer who drew it um, and turned it into a, a printed map. So if you were surveying something, you could squeeze into the symbols for trees and in the symbols for hashes and in very complicated earthwork sites, for instance, you could squeeze things in which perhaps shouldn't have been there. <laughs> Amazing. But because you know, the, the eye skim of, of things so quickly, you wouldn't immediately recognise. And there are many published examples where things have slipped through the check-in system in the Ordnance Survey and have been published. Things like... Frequently, I'll give you some examples of ones that have been found, and I know that we were all capable of doing, and some <laughs> m- some others other than me might have done them. He says <coughs> with a cough. Um, the the favourite was to squeeze dragons into complex river systems, and where there were lots of flow channels, for instance. The other thing was to squeeze strange looking shapes in amongst the trees that used to be drawn by hand at one time. Uh, And the other thing was to try and squeeze things into some of those lovely hasher shapes that you see on the maps. I I knew it, because that's exactly what I would do. (laughs) (laughs) I'd say that's also 
that's my evening gone now. I'm just going to be sitting and <laughs> scanning through. I think, I think that it was a BBC documentary about the Ordnance Survey, and they did have actually somebody on who said this was a tradition in the Ordnance, in the Ordnance <laughs> Survey and showed you some examples of things that had actually got, got through the system. So uh, you heard it somewhere else before you heard it from me. <laughs> but, yes, it was great fun. You've got to have a little bit of fun while you're working, haven't you? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we've heard a lot about your career and we've trodden around a few rabbit holes that I could have spent hours falling into and, and chatting. <laughs> but um, throughout your career, you've done a, a, a range of things. Is there any one thing that sort of stands out as, I'm really proud of that. I'm really pleased with that project, that job, that site, that uh, buying John a beer, for example, or anything, anything throughout your career. Or John buying him a beer. <laughs> <laughs> that would be something I remember, buying John a beer. <laughs> <laughs> As I said before, there are, there are lots of the of highlights, but I think in in many ways it would be easy to answer by saying, "Oh, I found this wonderful mutton bailey," which I once did, <laughs> you know, just by just by just by going out and looking. But there are hun- I would say literally hundreds of sites I've found or discovered just through doing what I do for a living and getting paid for it and loving every minute of it. But in many ways, one of the most fulfilling, perhaps is the right word to use, is a project I worked on not long after I retired, back in 2014 it was, where I ran a community archaeology project up in the North Pennines of England using LIDAR, which was relative, still relatively new then, Lawrence. You know, it, it 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 was being used in archaeology, but not much by... Uh, volunteers and the, and the general public, as it were. Mm. And I set up this project to look at a very large area of the North Pennines uh, by putting in place um, online toolkits, as it were, for, for volunteers to train them how to look at, at landscapes using LIDAR, how to integrate that with looking at maps and aerial photography to see if they could find new archaeological sites. And at the end of that project, we had found over 2,000 new archaeological sites in an area of 120 square kilometres. And some of those sites have actually rewritten the whole understanding of this area south of Hadrian's Mm. Wall. We found um, over 98 new Roman period settlements, enclosures, sites and field systems which hadn't been recorded before which kind of unlocked what was happening south of Hadrian's Wall in an area where none of these things had been recorded before. Uh, We found, when I say we, these are the volunteers looking at uh, images on their screen, um, including uh, two new henges as well. So, What what, what I'm trying to articulate here, it wasn't the, the... the thrill for me finding these things. It was the fact that you could take those basic skills of, of learning to look using some technology, LIDAR, which made everything accessible. People could sit at home and do it if they weren't able to get out, either through age or disability or, or whatever, and could engage with the landscape to the point where they could discover the landscape themselves. And what was so fulfilling was when that project was finished and written it up and you know, we, we were able to sit back and, and look at it. For me, it's a sheer thrill of seeing other people discover their own archaeology. That's amazing. And, and for me, that that's almost been one of the most fulfilling parts of my career, in a way, is kind of unlocking that potential in 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 others mm. to go out and do it themselves. And and the the one thing about landscape archaeology is you don't need very much to do it. Yeah, you know, a map. A pair of eyes, um, you know, some wellies and, and, and a fair wind, as it were. You don't need all this, this clever instrumentation. You don't need vastly expensive um, software or technology or anything like that. You don't need big yellow diggers to go with you and dig holes in mm-hmm. the ground. You can just wander through the landscape and enjoy it and learn about the past, but with just a few skills that... that uh, we all learn from somebody else. Whatever I've learnt, I've learnt from somebody else. And what people have, have learnt on that project 
they've learned through music where it's kind of hand i feel it's like handing on a landscape like a farmer hands on a landscape to the next generation it does feel like full circle Stuart, that knowledge and that information that you received throughout your career and then imparting it on to others that's a really nice thing to cover there i think what, what's also nice about that is that that self-driven sort of empowering of the participants rather than the sort of project officer led um, work which certainly is the large proportion of similar projects we see still taking place today certainly the ones you'll see whether it's in national parks or anything like that you will have a heritage lottery funded project that will employ someone to take volunteers out and and do it with them and corral them but that's a very different approach in terms of giving them the skills to do it themselves and the results you were seeing from that are well not to be sniffed at that's a fantastic answer so carrying on from pride then is there a project that you've observed or a piece of work or a researcher or a site that's been worked um that you've been particularly envious in in that time you've been what do we say 43 years of uh, of archaeology (laughs) envious Oh dear, oh dear. That's a dangerous one to uh, for, for me to open up as well. Um I I strangely enough, strangely enough, I was up in Yorkshire only the week before no, it was last, last week, week wasn't yeah. it, Lawrence? <laughs> got it. it was so traumatic, you know, the time scale. Um uh, uh, I was up in in, in um in Yorkshire with you, Lawrence, and we were wandering through uh, the forests up there, looking at wonderful barrows that survived amongst the forest planted, and you know we we're chatting and discussing them, uh, and so on. It's an area full of prehistoric pit alignments. You know, we've discussed those linear boundaries on on the hills, the divisions of landscape, which are probably late Bronze Age, early Iron Age in date, and certainly some elements, possibly even even go back to the, the very early Bronze Age. But there's a whole landscape of land division, of boundaries, of extreme complexities. I've studied little bits in detail. As I studied them many years ago, which was before LIDAR, before technology, um, done by almost like one guy on his own, um, uh, Don Spratt, and, and started to, to open this big idea, ideas about big landscapes and how they were divided up in North Yorkshire. And I think if it, in, in any way, if it, I've got envy, it would be um, an almost like with a time warp element built into it. I'd like to go back before that work started and start it <laughs> then, but have all the technology that we've got now, <laughs> LIDAR. LIDAR and, uh, and, and then, mm. So you could start the, the project from the same concept of here's this huge expanse of hills and there are these very strange earthworks, the, these earthwork pit alignments and dikes and ditches, and they all interlock with each other. What was that, what's that starting to tell us? I'd love to be able to go back and start that project afresh with, you know, with some <laughs> of the knowledge I've got now and some of the resources I've got now. Oh, that's a good answer. <laughs> you, you mentioned an element of a uh, time warping and time travel there, and I, I'm half tempted to, to give you an extra ticket for that because that sounds like a worthy use of a time machine. Um, but uh, <laughs> moving on to our, our, our usual finale of the podcast, um, regular listeners will know, Lawrence and I have obviously developed a working time machine, which is... Uh, a a feat of great engineering and rather than use it for evil we've used it to create a podcast Uh, (laughs) perfectly perfectly reasonable use of a time team um (laughs) sorry a time machine that was a freudian slip wasn't it um (laughs) a reasonable use for a time machine um if you had one return ticket and bear in mind you can go you can use it to go anywhere in the world at any time you don't have to be be in, in one fixed location where where would you go and what would you see and why? Oh, I'd like to go home. Mm-hmm. I'd like to go back to where I was brought up, the house I, I was not quite born in. I was born in a maternity home, but the house I lived in from being a baby up to being 18 and, and, and leaving home, which was a, a back-to-back house in a, a mill town in, in Yorkshire. And the reason I'd, I would like to go back there is because, in a way, it was the garden of that house that unlocked in many ways that sort of real not quite understanding what I saw in front of me because I lived in a long terrace of houses. Can you can you visualise like a, you know, these long back-to-back terraces, houses? Mm-hmm. Um, we lived in the middle and our garden was, was relatively long, about the size of the average bedroom now, but long compared to other people's. 
Um, at either end of the street, the gardens didn't exist, but the row of houses were straight. So if you imagine that straight row of houses, but curve, a curved boundary to this terrace going up. And I couldn't work out as a kid, why, why was it bent like that? And the houses were straight. I just could not, you know, it just seemed bizarre to me. I felt, you know, we were quite lucky and others were, were very, very unlucky not having a, you know, a garden in any way. And it was only later on when I started to acquire some landscape knowledge, when I looked at a historic ordnance survey map and saw that the, bound, the, the boundaries, these curving uh. boundaries were actually remnants of medieval curving ridge and furrow um, uh, and the mill owners that had bought the land to put the houses in for the workers had obviously bought a curving furlong or two <laughs> and plonked the houses in a straight line up the middle. So I can show you could draw that out in front of you what that looks like. Um, and it was that um, physical feature, you know, which kind of got me really, wow, you know, that... So I used to live in the middle of a medieval field. <laughs> so I would like I would like to use your time machine to go back to that garden in my old house in in this mill town called Mall in Earlies in Yorkshire, and stand in that garden and look at the medieval ploughman and the medieval fields around me, to to get that sense of that connection back to the past and and shamelessly use your time machine for that oh that's such a lovely time machine you Stuart and and unique I think um that's two in a row we had someone going to see the birth of cats last time Neil <laughs> and this, this brings us nicely back to the purpose of the time machine which is for historic environment and <laughs> such a lovely personal use of the machine as well in terms of that landscape and a site and a place that's so important to you so thank you for sharing that with us Stuart thank you so much for your time this evening as we say to all our guests but we genuinely mean it we could talk to you for hours um, and we'd love to just tease out more information but maybe we can buy you a pint next time we see you mm. and uh, and try and work out where these dragons are hidden in the uh, in the ordnance <laughs> map and what other things were hidden in your hasha drawings but um, it's been an absolute pleasure thank you for your your time this evening thank you everybody who have tuned in and and a huge thanks as well to our new patreon supporters who um who have, have come in last week mm. or so um as as we said at the start of this season this is the first season that Derek and I aren't actually paying for ourselves we're actually able to um fund <laughs> it through your support so thank you so much everybody and please keep listening